Excellent. Thanks so much for the very nice introduction, Dr. McHale, and thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. This is, I think, the only time I have left Seattle, and it was 77 degrees and sunny, and I landed in Los Angeles, and it was 50 degrees and cloudy. So it's a complete reversal from what I usually expect. It's been 70 degrees all week in Seattle. Absolutely unheard of. So anyways, what I'm going to be talking about today is something that I think uh, I have a lot of passion about because I would say, you know, the majority of the patients we see in clinic at the Myeloma Clinic at the University of Washington, Fred Hutch, are our second opinions from referring docs in the community. And the most common question by far and away is, what do I do with my patient who has relapsed multiple myeloma? And what I hope to impress upon you today is that, <clears throat> as we've heard from several of the speakers, including Dr. McHale recently, uh, this is not a homogenous disease. Uh, <clears throat> there's one great paper recently called The Multiple Myelomas, and I think that's a very succinct way of describing this disease. And because it is a heterogeneous disease, one size does not fit all. So the only disclosures I have are listed here. So uh, first of all, I want to go through the goals of the talk. So I think, um, in general, uh, you're not going to see algorithms, you're not going to see flow charts as much. I think that that sort of uh, grossly oversimplifies uh, the management of relapse multimyeloma, and so I've tried to avoid that. But I do want to establish a framework for how uh, <clears throat> myeloma doctors manage uh, relapse multimyeloma, uh, review the active treatment regimens for relapse multimyeloma, and um, I think one thing I'm, try I'm trying not to do is, is bog you down with Kaplan-Meier curves and hazard ratios, but reviewing the active treatment regimens, we all know which regimens are active, and going through kind of how to think about when they might be most useful. And then finally, understand, I think, and this is sort of an overarching theme of the talk, how to take a personalized approach to treating a patient's relapse multiple myeloma. So, to start, why is this so challenging? And I think, um, <clears throat> You know, to, to illustrate that, I took a, a recent review that was an excellent review by Dr. Dingley from the Mayo Clinic, and I, I ran it through a, um, <clears throat> a text mining software in R and created a word cloud. And so these are the most common words that you see in that um, review. And I think as if, if you're a community provider who's seeing, lots of my, who's seeing a few myeloma patients and you pick up a review article and you finish it, this is, I think, what you feel like after you've read it. There's all these drugs, there's all these words, there's patients that are, that are desperate for treatments, and I think uh, <clears throat> what's lacking is sort of a systematic uh, approach. Um, and while there are lots of active drugs for m relapse multiple myeloma, the challenge is, is using them all. So it's, uh, it's kind of a, a weird uh, <clears throat> catch-22. The, the second challenge about relapse multimyeloma is, as we've heard many times, relapse multimyeloma is not one disease. And so to illustrate that, uh, <clears throat> here is a graph that shows disease activity and time over years. And I want to start with, you know, probably the best case scenario, maybe a patient who has, you know, sort of an MGUS-like uh, situation after initial treatment. This is a patient who underwent initial treatment with RVD induction, autologous stem cell transplant, and lenalidomide maintenance, and only had a relapse years, maybe 10 to 15 years after having initial therapy, with a very slow relapse. The second situation, which we, I think, see more commonly, is a patient who has an initial response, who relapses uh, maybe in four to five years, and then relapses again after subsequent lines of therapy. And I think it's pretty clear that these are different patients. These are not, even though they both have multiple myeloma, they are not the same patient and they should be thought of differently. And then finally, this is, I, I think, probably a depiction of you know, what you would call a high-risk patient uh, who has a very quick response but also a very quick relapse with subsequent lines of therapy not providing much meaningful disease control. And so this is, I, I think it's clear that this is a far different patient than the patient in green who has a relapse only 10 to 15 years after transplant. The other patient only relapses uh, two to three years. So uh, the, the biology of these patients' disease is much different, and you have to consider that when, when looking at a patient who has relapsed. 
And then finally, from, uh, not just from a strictly clinical standpoint, which, which is what I was trying to illustrate with the prior slide, but from a biologic and genetic standpoint, relapse multiple myeloma is a much different beast than a newly diagnosed patient, just as newly diagnosed myeloma is far different than smoldering myeloma, and MGUS with respect to clonal heterogeneity uh, and mutations that can occur later in the disease. And so this is a very nice graphic that I like from a paper that was published by Dr. Gobriel's group at the Dana-Farber that illustrates that very nicely. And what we see here, looking at the, 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 the cross-section of patients with relapse multiple myeloma, these patients are far different. They have more mutations, there are more subclones, it is a more heterogeneous disease, and so it really has to be tackled much differently than uh, a newly diagnosed patient. So, uh, <clears throat> to sort of establish a framework, these, I, I was thinking about this a lot, and you know, what are the key questions that I ask when I ask a doc or I'm thinking about when I'm reviewing charts for a patient that I'm seeing for a consult when we're trying to figure out what the best way to manage a relapse patient is? The first question that I think is very important is what is their sensitivity to proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulatory drugs? As you all know, these uh, so-called novel agents, and the word novel agent doesn't make a lot of sense to me anymore because these drugs have been around now for over 10 years. These uh, are among the best agents that we have for multiple myeloma. And so, uh, cons and, and also, when looking at clinical trials that have, that have uh, looked at new agents in multiple myeloma, often uh, exclusion criteria are based on sensitivity or refractoriness to uh, PIs or IMIDs. So that's the first question I ask. The next question, which I think ties in nicely with, with what Dr. Costello talked about with respect to supportive care is, uh, what are the toxicities a patient uh, had with prior therapy? And so this, again, underscores the importance of supportive care and recognizing toxicities because it really plays into what you might choose for a subsequent line of therapy, as well as baseline comorbidities. As patients relapse, they're typically older than they were than, than they were diagnosed. They may have other comorbidities that are common in uh, older adults, such as congestive heart failure, coronary artery disease, or progressive type 2 diabetes. Finally, how urgently do I need to treat this patient? Is this patient having a biochemical relapse or are they having an overt aggressive clinical relapse? Those are much different situations. And I think most importantly, and since I'm from Fred Hutch, I can't not talk about autologous stem cell transplant since we transplant pretty much everybody there. Um, <clears throat> have they had a prior autologous stem cell transplant? For the most part, most of the patients that I'm seeing have. Uh, but um, I, I think in the community, I've been seeing a lot of patients who have deferred autologous stem cell transplant to later, and so it's important to talk about uh, that with a patient who's never had one, or even if they've had one, if they had a great duration of remission. So I think uh, these are the key phase three trials for relapse multiple myeloma. I don't want to bore you or bog you down with details. Uh, since it's near the end of the morning. But I organized these basically by um, <clears throat> since the, the population that the study enrolled. Uh, were they image sensitive, uh, PI and image sensitive, PI sensitive near the bottom, and carfilzomib naive? Um, we're going to go through each of these studies in somewhat detail, but these are kind of the things that would, you would, I would start to think about when deciding what therapy to choose. One important study that I did not include on here because I ran out of space was the Eloquent 3 trial, the randomized study of e elotuzumab, pomalidomide, and DEX versus pomalidomide and DEX, and that actually enrolled patients who were PI and IMID refractory. So uh, <clears throat> it's, it's also something to think about. So in general, my preference for treating relapse multiple myeloma is that three drugs is better than true drugs. As you can see here on the prior slide, these uh, studies all compared three drug regimens with two drug regimens, and all of them showed superiority of the three drug regimens. So my preference, if patients can tolerate it, is to go with three drug regimens, and I really think that should be the standard of care. But it's important, again, kind of going back to uh, the theme of the talk, one size does not fit all. Personalization is key. Uh, <clears throat> I certainly have 69-year-olds who simply cannot tolerate th three drug regimens for whatever reason. And so uh, <clears throat> I think you just have to let the patient be the guide. And <clears throat> certainly we don't want to undertreat patients, but we also don't want to overtreat patients and lead to toxicities that can also uh, shorten their life. <clears throat> so what are the toxicities from prior therapy and other comorbidities to consider? And this is largely a rehash of what Dr. Costello talked about already, but 
Uh, <clears throat> with bortezomib, I think the principal concern is peripheral neuropathy. And this can be a nasty, insidious thing. And sometimes I've, I've only seen it come up after someone's tapered off narcotics or maybe even after they've come off of maintenance. And <clears throat> uh, I think the, the most concerning grades of neuropathy are when they interfere with daily activities or when there's pain. And so that can really limit uh, subsequent use of bortezomib. Uh, <clears throat> many of the studies of daratumumab, which as you know is a CD38 monoclonal antibody, uh, excluded patients with a severe asthma or COPD because of the risk of pulmonary complications associated with infusion-related reactions. So I would, I would not say you cannot use daratumumab with COPD or asthma, but I would be cautious. And then with congestive heart failure, I'm typically very careful with carfilzomib. <clears throat> and then general frailty, I think, you know, obviously if you have a 90-year-old patient who's living in assisted living, uh, again, one size does not fit all, and I, we have done three drug regimens in, in patients above 80, but I have generally been a little more conservative there. So kind of going through the different classes of medications, starting with carfilzomib, which uh, since it's the first is, I guess it's no surprise that that's usually kind of, is for the most part, since patients uh, that we see in clinic are relapsing Typically, on lenalidomide maintenance, carfilzomib uh, is often the first drug that I will turn to when patients are relapsing. And so there's several different options for using this. Um, <clears throat> carfilzomib doublet with dexamethasone that was studied in the Endeavor trial. Carfilzomib plus an immunomodulatory agent, KRD, studied in the Aspire trial. Carfilzomib and cyclophosphamide. And finally, carfilzomib and daratumumab, which was presented at ASCO last year in the MMY, a sub group of the MMY-1001 study. The, the other question I would always ask when thinking about carfilzomib is, is retreatment with bortezomib an option? I have seen several, uh, many cases of patients who were treated initially with RVD alone, and after uh, several years got retreated with RVD and had a, had, had a great response. So uh, <clears throat> don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because carfilzomib is available doesn't mean you always have to turn to that. Retreatment with bortezomib is still a great option, provided that a patient had a good response the first time and provided that they don't have any coexistent neuropathy. I think the choice of the proteasome inhibitor should largely be driven by safety issues, patient preference, and really also to some extent how high risk the disease is. If I have a patient with a rapidly progressive uh, clinical course with a, a new deletion 17P, even if they were sensitive to bortezomib before, I might be more inclined to go with carfilzomib. And then in general, I consider carfilzomib and, and bortezomib as kind of my agents of choice for an aggressive relapse because uh, <clears throat> I think in general the data have shown that proteus inhibitors tend to work uh, among the most quickly of our agents. And so just to highlight a study that for me has been practice changing most recently, uh, the ARROW trial, that was a study that was presented at ASCO last year and published in the Lancet Oncology. This, I think, is a <clears throat> practice changing study for us at the SCCA. It was a study of once weekly carfilzomib at a high dose, 70 milligram per meter squared, versus the twice weekly carfilzomib that we use standard. And that showed uh, a, a dramatic improvement in the median progression-free survival for the patients treated with the high-dose weekly carfilzomib without a uh, substantial increase in the risk of uh, cardiac uh, toxicities or other complications from car carfilzomib. One thing to be, so the common things to be aware of with carfilzomib that we see, myelosuppression is a common issue. I have had several patients that really tank their platelets when getting treated with carfilzomib, and sometimes we can't get to that high dose. Um, <clears throat> uh, congestive heart failure, as was mentioned previously, about a 5 to 10 percent risk uh, seen in some uh, systematic reviews. Uh, and also, there are, uh, uh, in, amongst patients initially treated, there is a, a slight risk of, uh, of, uh, of HUS. Um, so just, just to be aware of it, but it would not make me shy away from using carfilzomib. Daratumumab is a monoclonal CD38 antibody. <clears throat> it is uh, uh, one of the most promising new agents over the last five years, and we've heard about it being incorporated into the upfront setting. Daratumumab has been studied with several partners, including lenalidomide in the Pollux trial, bortezomib in the Castor trial, and pomalidomide in the Aquellius trial, as well as monotherapy, and all have shown uh, an improvement in progression-free survival. And so I think the common question I get from referring docs is, well, I have a patient who's relapsed after transplant. Um, what should I go with? Should I go with daratumumab? Should I go with carfilzomib? And I think uh, 
<clears throat> as long as there's no compelling comorbidities that would say one or the other, I, I, I really think there's not sufficient data to say one is better than the other in the first relapse setting. Now that said, I typically prefer carfilzomib, as do many of my colleagues at the University of Washington, but I know uh, this, is re this is dependent on, on which institution you're at. I think either is a fine choice. I tend to prefer carfilzomib, but that is by no means the absolute right answer. Elotuzumab is another drug that does have strong activity for relapse multiple myeloma. Elotuzumab, importantly, has no single agent activity uh, and, and really only shows a, a signal when it's combined with an immunomodulatory agent. It is a SLAM F7 uh, monoclonal antibody and has been studied with two partners, lenalidomide and pomalidomide in the Eloquent 2 and 3 trial. And these are the data, the Kaplan-Meier curve uh, from the Eloquent 3 trial that, that despite this patient population being both IMID and proteasome inhibitor refractory, showed uh, a um, dramatic improvement in progression-free survival. So I think, um, I think we tend to underutilize this drug, and so I think it's important to remember to use it uh, in your patients that are relapsing. Uh, f uh, kind of moving on a little bit, I, I do want to touch on the type and timing of multiple myeloma relapse is important. And so we talked earlier about the importance of biochemical versus clinical relapse. And so biochemical, I think this, is, this term kind of comes from um, prostate cancer where you can have a biochemical relapse. What this refers to is when you have the reappearance of a monoclonal protein or the reappearance of an elevated free light chain in a patient without clinical evidence of disease progression. We compare that with a clinical relapse where a patient has new onset lytic lesions, maybe extramedullary disease, progressive anemia or kidney failure. Those are different situations. It is oftentimes okay to watch and wait a patient who has a biochemical relapse, provided that you are watching them closely, you have gotten appropriate imaging to make sure that they haven't sort of entered this non-secretory state that we see patients end up in sometimes, uh, and also that you're keeping a close eye on their blood work. Uh, but not all biochemical relapses are, are, are equivalent. And so one, one recent study that I think is really, uh, I think, uh, uh, tells a, a very important story is that relapse post-autologous transplant less than 12 months is a sign of very high-risk disease. This was data that was presented at the MRC9 trial at ASH last year, and they showed, I think, pretty convincingly that relapse at less than 12 months post-auto transplant is associated with a far worse progression-free progression-free survival. So for example, if I had a patient who had a known deletion 17P and had a biochemical relapse at less than, than uh, 12 months, I might not want to watch and wait that patient. That might be a patient where I'm much more aggressive uh, with my therapy and not choose to just take a watch and wait approach. So again, this is an individualized choice. You cannot just take a one size fits all for relapse multiple myeloma. Using genetic changes to guide treatment choice are increasingly becoming a part of uh, uh, treatment. And in the interest of time, I will skip over some of this because we've heard about the use of continuous therapy with three drug maintenance for high risk myeloma. Uh, <clears throat> we've heard also about venetoclax earlier today from Dr. McHale. Uh, I will only say uh, that I have had patients with high risk plasma cell leukemia who, for whom nothing had worked where venetoclax uh, given obviously outside of the FDA approval, uh, was able to uh, keep the patient in remission. So uh, I, I personally believe this drug has an important role to play in multiple myeloma, but we'll have to figure out uh, the, the toxicities and what's going on with the Bellini trial. And then finally, plasma cell leukemia has a unique disease biology. Uh, classically, this refers to at diagnosis having the, the presence of more than 20% plasma cells circulating in the blood. At our institution, we have tended to use anthracycline-based regimens like VTD-PACE, hyper-CVAD, or DCEP, uh, but uh, certainly there's no uh, you know, strong randomized data here. So I think, in general, you just want to be aggressive with plasma cell leukemia. Finally, uh, just to touch on one final point before we finish up, and I think this is really critical, because I think with the, with the advent of uh, you know, so-called novel agents and, and newer monoclonal antibodies, we've, we, we sometimes forget that second transplants can be very effective for treatment of relapse multiple myeloma. And so these are the questions I ask in a patient who's had a late relapse. And so really what these questions are getting at is, is the patient fit enough to undergo a second transplant and do they still have stem cell sort? At our center, viability has been good for up to 10 years and beyond. 
And are they even willing to undergo a second transplant? Occasionally I have patients who say, doc, there's no way you're gonna make me do that again. And so I think uh, this is an individualized choice, but it's one that should be explored. And so in general, our rule of thumb when to consider a second transplant, if a patient was, had a, a duration of remission after a transplant on maintenance therapy that was over three to four years, it's something that I think we've been discussing. Uh, it, it, you can make a much more strong case for it if a patient had a 10 to 15 year duration of remission after transplant, although that's uncommon. And then finally, uh, very important to remember that if a patient only had RVD and maintenance for their initial therapy, you should strongly consider uh, autologous transplantation as consolidation when that patient is in remission again after getting reinduced. And these, this is a very nice graph that I think displays uh, very nicely. This is data from the Mayo Clinic showing the impact of, of uh, salvage transplant and relapse multiple myeloma. And the key take home point here is that the longer time to progression after autologous transplant number one, the better bang for your buck you get with auto transplant number two. And so that's why these rules exist with respect, or not rules, but guidelines exist with respect to uh, when we consider a second transplant. So uh, I hope I have left you with the, uh, on a positive note, there are many options for treating relapse multiple myeloma. Personalization is key. You cannot take a one-size-fits-all approach for this disease. That would be to the detriment of your patient. Uh, I, I and most uh, providers tend to choose therapies based on prior sensitivity, disease status, and toxicities. And don't forget about autologous stem cell transplantation. So thank you very much.